In this video, we'll use the MS-DOS debug program to demonstrate some techniques for debugging assembly language code. Many experienced programmers will have used debugging tools before. Debugger is the name given to a class of programs that let us interact with our own programs while they're running. Debuggers have a wide range of capabilities. One basic function of a debugger is single stepping through code, pausing execution after every instruction. Most debuggers also support setting breakpoints. A breakpoint is a specific location in the program where the debugger will pause. Debuggers can display the contents of registers and memory while execution is paused. Some debuggers have many other advanced features, so the name debugger falls short of describing everything these utilities actually do. But the typical use case for using a debugger is finding bugs, that is, finding the reasons a program doesn't behave as expected. A debugger is very useful when a programmer can't find a bug by studying the source code. To follow along with the demonstration, you'll need a DOS environment with the debug program installed. The MS-DOS and FreeDOS operating systems both come with debug installed, as do some versions of Windows. As of this recording, DOSBox X comes with debug installed, but DOSBox doesn't. I recommend installing DOSBox X on a host machine as the easiest way to start using debug. You can download a binary package from the DOSBox X website if one is available for your operating system. Or you can install it from your operating system's package manager. The debug utility has had several changes over the many years it's been in use. Different versions may have small differences in their interfaces. This demonstration is fully tested in the debug utility provided in MS-DOS 6.22, FreeDOS, and DOSBox X. With the DOS environment prepared, we're ready to start using debug. We can start DOS debug with no arguments. In that case, debug loads an empty program into memory or we can run it with the file name of a program, in which case it'll load that program into memory. In either case, it waits for input from us before executing the program. Let's launch debug with no arguments by entering debug at the DOS command prompt. We're greeted by a very sparse hyphen prompt. The debug utility is command line driven. We can get a synopsis of commands by typing the question mark command. When I was a young DOS user in the 90s, I'd see debug in my list of DOS programs and run it. I'd type the question mark command and read the list, but I had no idea what any of it meant. I didn't understand the power that lay before me at that time. Anyway, let's try the register command by entering R. To run each command, we use the letter in the second column of the help display. When run with no arguments, the register command displays the state of the CPU registers and flags. All this is the current CPU state that will be used to run the next instruction. The last line of output describes the next instruction to be executed. All output values shown in debug are in hexadecimal. That goes for input as well. Even though we don't use a prefix or a suffix to specify the base, every value is hex. The instruction pointer is at 100 hex, which is the standard location for DOS to load a program into memory. The DS, ES, SS, and CS segment registers all have the same value, indicating that the code and data for this program are all in one memory segment. The specific value of these registers is chosen by DOS and debug. The first column of the last line shows the memory location referenced by the code segment register and instruction pointer register in segment, colon, offset notation. The second column shows the contents of that memory location and possibly the next few as well. These values are the machine code of the next instruction to run. The last two columns are the mnemonic and operands of the assembly language instruction that corresponds to that machine code. Said more simply, the last line of output shows us the memory location, machine code, and assembly code of the next program instruction to be executed. In our case, that is a return instruction but the value depends on your DOS environment and debug version. Let's use debug to assemble and run a tiny program. We'll enter the assemble command to start assemble mode. Debug displays the memory location where the next instruction will be assembled. We'll add a no-op instruction and invoke interrupt 2.0 hex. 
Then we'll leave the next line empty, which exits assemble mode. If we run the register command again, we can see the next instruction is now the noop instruction. Now we'll run the go command to run our program. Debug prints the message program terminated normally. So we've used debug's power as an assembler to write and run a simple program. We'll look at the go command in more detail later. We used interrupt 2o hex to terminate the program instead of the typical function 4c hex of interrupt 2 1 hex. The reason for this is terminating by interrupt 2 1 hex while inside debug may cause debug to exit and return us to the DOS prompt. Using interrupt 2 o hex terminates our program within debug but returns us to the debug command prompt. Now that we've used a few debug commands, let's look more closely at the types of arguments we can use with them. If you look at the help display, you can see that many debug commands accept an address or a range as arguments, and some accept either or both. An address is a single memory location in segment colon offset notation. Let's use the dump command to display the program segment prefix, or PSP, which starts at offset zero of our data segment. Each line of the dump output shows us the hex values of 16 bytes of memory. The line starts with the segment offset location of the first byte to be shown. This value is always on a 16-byte boundary. After the segment offset location, the contents of 8 bytes of memory are shown, starting at that location. Then there is a hyphen separator, then 8 more bytes. Finally, the same 16 bytes are displayed as characters. That is, if a byte can be represented in the ASCII character set, it is. Otherwise, it's displayed as a period character. We know our data segment is ODAB hex because that's the content of the DS register. We can also use the name of a segment register as the segment value. This command is equivalent to the last. When an address is specified with no segment value, debug defaults to using the contents of one of the segment registers as the segment value. Commands that work with code, like assemble and go, use the CS register as the segment value. Commands that work with data, like dump, use the DS register instead. Since we're working with COM programs and they use the same segment for all code and data, we can omit the segment for the rest of this demonstration and trust that debug will use ODAB hex as the segment value. So this command is equivalent to the last two in our case. When a single address is given as an argument to the dump command, debug defaults to showing up to some default number of bytes. Here that's 128. The PSP is 256 bytes long, so we're not seeing the whole thing. We can control the number of bytes displayed by giving dump a range instead of a single address. We can construct a range argument like this. Zero is the starting address of the range using the address syntax we just established. L stands for length and 100 hex is 256 decimal, so we're specifying a range starting at offset zero and 256 bytes long. We can also construct a range using the starting address and ending offset. If we want to view only the final 8 bytes of the PSP, a range can't cross from one segment to another. When specifying a range this way, the end of the range must be an offset only, not a segment offset pair. In addition to the address and the range argument types, another useful argument type is the list. Lists are sequences of one or more bytes or character strings or both. We can introduce lists in the enter command at the same time. Enter takes an address as the first argument and a list as an optional second argument. When no list is given, enter lets us interactively replace the contents of memory starting at the given address. Entering an empty value leaves enter mode and returns to the command prompt. Let's use enter interactively to change the contents of offsets 200 and 201 hex. When a list is given, enter replaces memory starting at the given address with the values in the list, and then returns to the command prompt. Let's use enter this way to change the same memory as before.
A single list may mix both bytes and character strings. Let's use enter to place a string in memory. This is an example of mixing character strings with numeric values in a single list. At offset 200 hex, we placed a string with the text DOS says hi, then a smiley face, then a carriage return, then a line feed, and finally a dollar sign character to terminate the string. O2 hex is the character code for a smiley face. OD hex and OA hex have dual representations in DOS depending on the situation. They have character representation in the code page 437 character set, but they may also represent ASCII carriage return and line fee control codes, and that's how we'll use them here. Let's look at our string with the dump command. We can read the characters in the string in the last column of the output. Unfortunately, the smiley face doesn't appear since debug only prints ASCII characters and it isn't one. But if we look at the list of hexadecimal values, we can see the O2 hex byte is there where it should be. Now we've covered the dump and enter commands, and in doing so we've also covered address, range, and list argument types in detail. Most arguments that aren't one of these types are either simple hex integer values or names of registers or drives. This is all we need to know about debug arguments to use the rest of its commands effectively. Now that we've declared a string, we might as well write a program to print it. We're going to use the assemble command again. Assemble lets us write assembly language instructions. Debug will assemble them right into memory as we go. It takes an optional address argument as the location to begin assembly. If no address is given, it starts assembling at the location referenced by the CS IP register pair. Let's leave the code we assembled earlier where it is and start assembling at a different location. We enter an empty instruction to signal that we're finished assembling. Debug's assemble command is very primitive compared to any dedicated assembler, but it has the advantage of interactive assembly directly into working memory. Now we can start running our program with the go command. The go command executes the program and then returns to the command prompt. It takes an optional address argument which sets the starting address for execution. If no address is given, it uses the location referenced by the CS IP register pair as the starting address. It also takes an optional list of offsets to be used as breakpoints. If execution reaches a breakpoint before the program finishes, debug stops execution early. It returns to the command prompt and the CS IP register pair references the instruction at the breakpoint location. We'll use breakpoints a bit later. If we ran go without an address argument, it would start execution at offset 100 hex. Since we assembled this program starting at 170 hex, we'll start execution there. We won't set breakpoints, so the program will run to the end. We can see our string printed on the display before the program terminates. What if we want to print a string with a long repeating pattern in the middle? This is going to be a pretty silly example, but I needed a sag to introduce the fill command, and this is it. Fill accepts a range argument and a list argument. It fills the range of memory with the list values, repeating them as many times as will fit into the range. Let's fill 256 bytes of memory with a repeating pattern. Now 300 hex through 3ff hex is filled with a repeating pattern of O's and E's. Let's make the start and end of our string. Here we patched up the first few and last few characters a bit. We can see the full string in the last column of the dump output. If we want to try printing our new string but don't want to change our program permanently, we can do that. Let's run the program again with go, but make it stop before calling the display string service. Let's look at the disassembly to see where the instruction is. The interrupt 21 hex instruction is at offset 175 hex, so we'll put a breakpoint there. 
Because of our breakpoint, debug stopped execution at 175 hex, just before the interrupt 21 hex instruction. We are about to invoke the display string service, but the DX register contains the address of the old string. Let's update it to point to the new one. We've already seen the display form of the register command, which is used by entering the command with no arguments. Now we'll use the change form, which lets us change the contents of a register. If we pass the optional register argument, debug shows a new prompt with the name of the register and its current contents. We can enter a new value here to change the contents of the register. Let's verify the change. Newer versions of debug also support an optional value argument to the register command. In that case, this command is equivalent to the last one. Okay, now let's finish the program by using go with no arguments. The CS IP register pair references the location of the interrupt 21 hex instruction. That's where we put our breakpoint last time. So running the go command with no arguments resumes our program from where we stopped it and runs it until it's finished. And our program prints the string at 300 hex instead of the one at 200 hex. Let's run the program again from the beginning. This time the program prints our original string, not the second one. When we change the register to print the second string, we are interacting with that execution of our program. The program itself remains the same. Because the first instruction moves the address of the original string at 200 hex into register dx, we'll get the original result on subsequent runs unless we make a change to the program. We're finished working with the string at 300 hex, but we'll just leave it in memory there. When we save our program to a file later, we won't save that part of memory. Let's look at our program disassembly again. The last instruction of the program is at offset 177 hex and occupies two bytes. Our string starts at offset 200 hex. All the memory between our code and our string is wasted. Let's see how much that is. The hex command is a hex calculator. It takes two value arguments and adds and subtracts them. The first column of output is the first argument plus the second. The second column is the first minus the second. So we have eight seven hex bytes of wasted data in our program. Let's use the move command to move the string to the end of our program code and recover that wasted data. The last character of the string is the dollar sign at offset 200 hex. So our string is 100 hex bytes long, or 16 in decimal. The first free byte after our program is at offset 179 hex. So we'll move 16 bytes starting at offset 200 hex to offset 179 hex. Let's disassemble the program again. Now starting at 179 hex, there is a bunch of what looks like random instructions. That's actually our string data. Debug doesn't know that, and it's interpreting it as machine code and disassembling it for us. It'll never actually be executed as code, but we just need to know the difference between code and data in the program when we're trying to display it. Let's look at the same memory with the dump command. This is the opposite of the last situation, where the first several bytes being displayed are the program code. But starting at 179 hex, we can see our string data. Just like in x86 assembly language, the move command is actually a copy. Our original string is still at offset 200 hex. Let's use the fill command to erase it, and replace it with zeros. Now let's run our print string program again from start to finish. Well, that's not the output we want. Let's step into the program and find the problem. Instead of the go command, we're going to use the trace command this time. Like the go command, the trace command executes the program in memory. It accepts an optional address argument that sets the starting address for execution, using the location referenced by the CSIP register pair as a default. 
Unlike the go command, it accepts an optional count argument instead of a breakpoint list. The count argument is the number of instructions trace executes before stopping execution. If count isn't specified, trace uses a count of one, also called single stepping. Let's use trace to single step through the program. Everything looks fine with the CPU state so far. Okay, we're about to execute interrupt 21 hex, but the DX register points to the old location of the string. Since we moved it and deleted the old one, we need to change our code. We could use the assemble command to assemble a new instruction at the same location as the old one, or we can use the enter command to just change the bytes of the address. Now let's run one more time. Great, everything looks good now. As mentioned, the count argument tells Trace how many instructions to execute before stopping. We used two single trace commands to execute the program up to the interrupt 21 hex instruction, but we could have gotten the same effect with a single trace command with a count of two, like this. When used this way, trace still prints the CPU state before every instruction it executes. If you're looking for a problem and know it's several instructions away from the beginning of the program or the current point of execution, the count argument is a convenient way to avoid typing many trace commands in a row. Our program is only held in memory right now. What if we want to save our work? Debug lets us write memory to files. To do that, we first set our program's file name using the setName command. The setName command sets the file name of the program. The file name is used by the load and write commands to read or write programs on disks. All arguments to setName are optional, and if run with no arguments, no file name is set. The first argument to the setName command is the file name. It can be fully qualified by DOS drive and directory paths. Those are optional, and the current DOS directory is assumed if they're not given. The second argument to setName is a list of DOS command prompt arguments. The load command uses these arguments as if they were passed to the program when running it at the DOS command prompt. To write our program to a file on the disk, we use the write command. The write command takes a single optional address argument. This is the address and memory from which to start writing data. The default is to start writing from address 100 hex. Unlike the other commands we've used, the contents of the CPU registers also act as arguments to the write command. The BX register must contain the high order byte of the size of the file to write, and the CX register must contain the low order byte. The program starts at offset 100 hex, and the last byte of our program is stored at 188 hex. That's 89 hex bytes of data to save. The BX register is already zero, so we just need to set the CX register to 89 hex. Now we'll execute the write command, which will write the program stored in offsets 100 hex through 189 hex to a file. Debug confirms the number of bytes written. Now the program is written to the myprog.com file on disk and can be run from the DOS command prompt outside of the debug utility. But if we run the program from the command prompt, all it does is return us right back to DOS. That's because it runs the first program we assembled at offset 100 hex, not the string printing program we assembled at 170 hex. Now let's exit debug. We can do this with the quit command. Let's start debug again. This time we'll pass the file name of our new program as its argument. Debug loads the myprog.com file instead of starting with an empty program. Debug loads the whole program from our file starting at offset 100 hex. Everything is just as we left it when we quit debug. These are all the DOS debug commands we'll cover in this video, but there are several others you may want to learn. The proceed command is useful for stepping over procedures. The search and compare commands can be used to analyze binary data. Debug is a very powerful utility. You can do I.O. from ports with the input and output commands, 
and even directly read and write sectors from hard and floppy drives with the load and write commands. Be careful writing directly to drive sectors from debug. Well, I hope I've convinced you of the usefulness of the DOS debug utility. Its execution tracing and data manipulation commands give it the power of a step debugger. The assemble command makes it a simple interactive assembler. And with the file IO commands, we can use debug as a hex editor too. There is a caveat to using debug with code that calls interrupts. Tracing into DOS interrupt 21 hex may sometimes cause unexpected results or freeze the machine. A best practice is to avoid tracing into interrupts. Instead, use the go command with a breakpoint at the address after the interrupt instruction to go around it. In modern times, we may not want to write a lot of assembly language code with debug. There are better options available. But it's still a great option for debugging programs and experimenting with x86 assembly and machine code. If you are interested in DOS, please look at the other videos on my channel for more on this topic. And if you liked this video, I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.